conquer over Satan apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't really want to pit myself against Satan. I'd rather let my Savior and my Lord do that. Don't you see? Say, so why do you do that, preacher? Because I know the flesh, and I know my flesh. And my flesh is just as, is, is just as, just, still just as corrupt. Paul said in Romans 7, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. That's a present tense, dwelleth now, here and now, no good thing. So my flesh is still, my flesh still has no good thing. Therefore, by the Spirit, I have to mortify and bring into subjection my flesh. All right? I know how easily that we can be puffed up in pride. And sometimes pride is so subtle, so subtle, that it, that it, that it uh, camouflages itself. And it can even appear as humility. Oh, yeah. It is the most deceptive of all the sins because it is the mother of all sins. It is the seat of it. It is where it all originated. I will, I will, I will, I will. So we have to constantly be on the lookout to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God. And the Bible says a meek and quiet spirit in the sight of God is great. Didn't he say that? As of great value. God sees it. He puts great stock in a humble and a contrite and a quiet spirit. Now, contrast that with the seven sons of Sceva in the book of Acts. You remember them? They were exorcists. And they took upon themselves to cast the demon out of the unclean spirit and said, we adjure thee. They had their formula. They were good at it. They had worked it all out. They knew exactly what to say. Whether they had heard another exorcist say it that way or they got, to, they got together and said, well, now let's, let's get something that sounds good to the people. So we adjure thee by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. That's what they said to come out. And what happened to them? The Bible says Jesus we know and Paul we know. The demon did inside that one. But who are you? And then the scripture says it came out of them and leaped on them and beat them and cut them and tore their clothes off. And they left that place and, and wounded and beaten and defeated. And Well, that's the way you will too. You will too. If you have a cavalier attitude about the spirit world. Uh, in the book of Jude... Uh, he's accused of quoting two or three different apocryphal books. One is the book of Enoch. The other is the Assumption of Moses. These are Jewish apocryphal books. Now, you know, I've told you before about what the apocryphal books are, pseudepigraphic books and all of that. Uh, you get into this, if you, if you start reading and studying this, they'll say, well, you know, Jude is quoting the Assumption of Moses, which is an apocryphal book, because in it, it says that this apocryphal book says, it refers to this event in history. It says that when, when, when Michael and Satan came together, that Satan threw up in the face of Michael the fact that Moses had murdered an Egyptian. And so therefore he wasn't qualified because of that to be buried with honor in a location. And of course, that explains why there was a contention for the body of Moses. Now, is that true, preacher? Now, listen. A lot of times, when you read something that has a story attached to it, it may have an element of the truth. It may have an element of the truth. You've got to remember this. You have inspired scripture. That's the 66 books. Then you have all these volumes out there, and there are many of them that purport to be the Word of God but are not. But they do have elements of the truth. They do have elements of the truth. You've got to remember that. So what do you do? I stick with the Bible. Just like I told you a moment ago, Michael is the only archangel mentioned in Scripture. Gabriel is not called an archangel. I've referred to him as that in time past because he, his name means the man of God. I'm the one, he said, that stands before the Lord. And if you'll remember, he's the one who announced to Mary that she'd have a child. And so Gabriel is a mighty angel, no question about that. But the Bible doesn't say he's an archangel. Now this world that we're talking about is a world that you have to go through if you're going to pray. 
If you're going to draw nigh to God, you have to deal with the spirit world. And you ought to. You want to. You should desire to. Because if you don't have that complete, that real fellowship and that, that uh, communion with the Father and the Son, then who do you think you're going to be communing with? Now think of, this, think of a Christian that is not in fellowship with the Lord. All right? You're not dead in sins and trespasses. That's the unsaved. So there's no communion with them. There's no way that an unsaved man can commune with God. Uh, the Bible says the flesh lusteth against the spirit. There is no way. There's, there's no connection. There's no, there's, no, there's no channel to reach. There's no line to connect. But a saved man is a man or a woman who has been made dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ by virtue of the fact that they're born again. In John 15, he said, without me, you can do nothing. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And that doesn't mean that you are for a while or you are when you're in communion. It means that you are, period. And of course, when you read John 15 and you read it carefully, what does he say about that vine that doesn't bear fruit or that branch that doesn't bear fruit? Cuts it off. You see, this idea that you can get saved and live any way you want to, I don't know who created that, but that's not the New Testament I read. A number of times in the New Testament, a list is given. It talks about men stealers and fornicators and liars and adulterers and abusers of themselves with mankind and so forth. The list is just, it's, it's in there about five or six times, the New Testament. And every time that list shows up, it says this, don't be deceived. If you live like this, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, you say, well, now I'm once born again, always born again. How are you living? How are you living? How are you living? He said in the book of Hebrews chapter number 12, that if you are a partaker, all this list that he gives, if you're a partaker, without chastisement, without any, without any, without any movement of God in your life, he said, you're, he said, you're deceived. You're a bastard, not a son. You don't belong to him. How you living? You see, I honestly believe that if you're truly, truly, truly born again, that you are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, and that the fruit, F-R-U-I-T singular, of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, long-suffering, all these things. That's the fruit of the Spirit. And the Bible said, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's what? He's none of his. I believe in eternal security. I believe if you've been born again, you belong to God by the, by the grace of God. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself. I believe that. And I know that the apostle says, I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. But my experience has been that most Baptists that I've known, and that's the ones I know, I don't know the Methodists, I don't know the Presbyterians, I don't know the Lutherans, but I know the Baptists. Most of them have a cavalier attitude toward their salvation. Well, I ain't going to hell, so, you know, I've got fire insurance and... And God knows we sin every day, and, and we just can't help it, and, and you know, and, and so this is just the best we can do. No, sir, brethren. No, sir. Not the God I know. I'm afraid that there's a great deception, deceptive mantle, deceptive mantle that has fallen upon people. And it is, and it is that. You, listen, once you belong to Him, you belong to Him, and you're not your own anymore, and you don't just live any way you please. And if, you just, and, and if you continue to live any way you please and there's no real fruit of the Spirit in your life and there's no battle going on, you don't know Him. And I want to help you because you don't want to find out at the end of your life that you've been deceived. That's not the time to find it out, folks. When darkness begins to descend on your soul and you're about ready to go out into eternity and terror begins to set in on you and you don't know where you're going. And here you are, you think you've been saved, but there's no assurance and there's no power and there's no victory. You don't want that. You don't want that. You don't want that. You don't want that. We are falsely accused of teaching that you can get saved and live any way you want to. I don't believe that. Do you believe that? 
And I don't believe that for a minute. How powerful is this world?